Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Better Sex Podcast. This is your host, Jessa, and I'm just delighted you're here. Thank you for tuning in and spending this time with me. I have so much fun doing this. I got to tell you, this is maybe the best part of my business is getting to talk to all these fascinating people about these fascinating topics and I learn things and I get challenged and I get energized and it's just really fun. And today's episode is is a really good one. I've been waiting to do this one for a long time. I first contacted Tristan about doing the show a year ago probably and it took a long time to get the schedules to line up and the availability but I gotta say something about being in quarantine during COVID which we are as I record this Uh, meant there was a little bit more space in her schedule. So I am so grateful to talk to Tristan Taormino about doing non-monogamy well, right? I've had other episodes about non-monogamy and what some of the choices are and who's it for and what if people are considering it. This episode is really, okay, we're going to do this. What do we need to talk about? What do we need to agree to? And what are the kinds of problems or difficulties or challenges we're likely to encounter, right? So it's really about maybe avoiding some of the pitfalls, navigating some of the pitfalls, uh, but really how how do we make this a fulfilling, um, happy situation for everybody involved? That's really the focus of this. So I hope you find it interesting, whether you're non-monogamous or not, uh, could be useful information to file away, but I hope you get a lot out of it. before we start the show today, it is sponsored by Intimacy with Ease. It's a method to help otherwise happy couples achieve a sex life that is easy and fun for both of them. So you can actually just enjoy your sex life with zero stress. For more information, if you want to watch a brief little training video that's available, all of that, go to intimacywithease.com. So Tristan, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited about this because we have talked on my podcast before with people about open relationships in general, but I really want to focus on how do people do this successfully, I mean, mutually, in a mutually satisfying way or however I'd, I'd phrase that. So, uh, and you wrote the book, so, you know. I, I wrote the book. Yeah, it's funny about successful. I know I've been finding myself resisting that word lately too, right? That yeah relationships have to be a success. It sounds like it's somehow tied to capitalism or something. Um, <laughs> so yes, mutually satisfying, like working yeah. for all parties. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Right. So I thought maybe I'd start just by asking a basic question about, are there contraindications for people opening their relationship? Is that something you've identified and sort of said, <laughs> rethink, I love that. rethink I, this? I love that question. This may, may interfere with the... Um, the meds that you're already on. So, well, first of all, I think it's important that people do not try to go into an open relationship if, if it was monogamous and they're thinking of opening it up in order to kind of save it. Yeah. Because what happens is once you open your relationship, every problem you've ever had is magnified. It's huh. everything is bigger. And so now, now that said, I know tons of people who have successfully opened their relationship after an incident of cheating. You know, we don't, we don't talk about that, right? Because we want to make yeah. it all seem like we all came to it with smiles and love and great boundaries. But sometimes, you know, like Esther Perel it has some amazing work on cheating. And as she says, uh, cheating can be an opportunity to kind of look inward and look at the relationship. And so sometimes what happens is 
when people process that, one or both of them say, you know, I'm not getting all my needs met here, but I don't want to end this relationship. I think maybe I can get some of my needs met with another person. So I think that's different than going, oh, this is like a last ditch effort. Let's just see if this works. But we haven't processed any of our, you know, any of our problems or issues. Well, even with cheating, I would imagine the processing part of that is important because I've had Absolutely. clients show up and say they've cheated and now let's just be poly and sort of never, never bridge the, uh, what happened with the cheating and the dishonesty of that. And no, then there's 10 conscious, steps. Right, right. right. That make a conscious choice to open potentially if that's yes. the right thing for them. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so that's one thing sort of don't. And then I, I actually say, if you don't like processing your feelings or processing other people's feelings, if you're not someone who enjoys that, or at least can um, tolerate and respect that and devote time to it, if that's not your jam, you don't want to be in an open relationship. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Cuz it gets right? ex- because, exponential, right? In terms yeah, of Yeah, it's there's yeah. a lot of talking and processing. Everyone thinks there's a lot of sex, um and there can be, but there's a lot of talking and yeah. a lot of processing. So you don't need to like quote unquote like have your stuff together, right? We're all still working on ourselves. Right. But you need to be open to working on yourself because a lot of stuff is going to come up and you're going to think it's about the open relationship or the other person, but actually it's really about you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so I think that's another caution. If, if you're not into process, you're probably not into open relationships. Yeah. Okay. So what, what are the conversations people should have if, if they've decided they want to be open and stuff that s- really set them up for this to be enjoyable, satisfying for all parties involved, <laughs> you know, like what should they be thinking about ahead of time? Yeah. So I think a mistake that folks make is that they run into it like a kid in a candy store, <laughs> right? And so, and then it all kind of falls apart. So the first thing I'm going to say is start out slowly. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, don't try to do all things at once. Yeah. You are going to set some limits and set some boundaries and make some agreements. And you can expand those as you go on. But let's start with small things and small goals to just build trust. And and so that we're not like, okay, tomorrow I'm going out and getting another girlfriend. Right? That might be too much. Yeah. But what about flirting with people? What about considering going on a date with someone, right? We don't have to go full throttle. So, so go slow. You're going to make mistakes. Mm. Oh, you're going to make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> we all make mistakes. We, yeah. I am someone who's been doing this for 20 years. I wrote the book. I still make mistakes. Mm-hmm. People are human. So you got to give yourself space to do that. And sometimes the way that we learn that we have a boundary is by stumbling into or over it. Right. 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 We, we can't, we, we can think of everything we can think of beforehand in advance, and then we're not going to think of something. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And it's going to push our buttons and we're going to be like, what? <gasps> so, um, so going slowly, giving yourself permission to, to mess up. And I think... I think people need to just sit down and think, what do I need to feel like I can do this? I can do this form of non-monogamy and feel good about it. And what it's sort of this fine line between how can I get everything I want and (laughs) feel safe? And how can my partner feel safe? Right. right. There's this like, there's this little window that you both have to sort of come to. Mm-hmm. Right. So everyone's allowed to say what they want and say what they need and put it out on the table. Right. And then you've got to figure out, okay, does one of these things give me a pit in my stomach when I think about it and I'm going to have a panic attack right now? So maybe we got to back off that thing. Okay. Or Maybe the person who's having the panic attack says, I'm going to bring this to my individual therapy. I'm going to talk about why this is triggering me, why this is pushing my buttons. Um, doesn't have to be either or. Yeah. 
But I think putting out there what you want and what you need that you know to be true, you know, I think people sometimes have a fantasy of what they want and then they begin to edit that fantasy based on what they think their partner's going to say, right, how they right. think their partner's going to receive that or what they're going to judge them about. You, you know what I mean? So yes. I think it's important to, for all the information you have, to share it. But also say, I'm going to share everything, like in an ideal world, everything. But I am open to compromise. We're a team. I, you know, I think that's just really important. Yeah. yeah. And so what are some of the, I want to use the word, guardrails, but I'm not sure that's quite the right word, but agreements, <laughs> agreements. Like, yeah, the yeah. kinds of discussions or, you know, like I'm thinking about, do we do this at our own, own house? Do we, or, do we start mm-hmm. a flirt or date or have sex with somebody we both know? Like, right. Mm-hmm. There must be mm-hmm. standard topics that the two people should probably talk about. Yeah. Starting out. Right. Yeah. I have like these lists, these checklists in my book, which I have okay. to update, but I'm a big fan of checklists. <laughs> <laughs> to-do lists are like one of my fetishes on fat yeah. life. So I'm really into organization. Well, I think you should think about your basic kind of outline or style. Like, are you going to pursue sex with other people or maybe kinky play with other people, but you don't have the intention of developing an emotional or a love or committed relationship with them? hmm Are you seeking emotional love commitment relationships with other people? How much time do you actually have in your life when you have your job, your friends, your spouse or your partner, family, all, you know, all the things, hobbies, hopefully, um, all those things. So how, you know, like assess how much time do I actually have to put into this? So get a sense of just kind of the outline. Do do we want to pursue other people together, mm-hmm. right? We're, we're, we're a package deal. Right. So if we pursue one person or two people or three people, whatever the configuration is, we want to do it together. We want to be there. We want to be present for it. No, no separate relationships, no separate experiences. That could be something that you consider. Yeah. I love that you said people we know, because I do think it's healthy to draw certain boundaries around like familiarity and community. You know, this makes me think of if, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to generalize here, but if you live in San Francisco and you're deeply embedded in in this non-monogamy community and you're a lot of your friends are non-monogamous and you may may be like, Hey, I'm interested in some of these people. Other people may say, I want to keep this compartmentalized. Right. When you go out of town on your business trips, you can have a hookup. Right. But I do not want the hookup to be the woman I'm going to see at the bank tomorrow when in our hometown. Right. Right. In some cases, I remember I interviewed this couple who lived in the deep South and they were very involved in their community, very involved in their church. And they said, we can't invite people here. We don't want to raise any sort of eyebrows. We want to do this in nearby towns, out of town. Um, So that could be, it could be sort of limited by geography, right? And also, yeah, I think it's fair to say no people you work with. Maybe that's a boundary, right? Right. Or or maybe it's like none of my exes. I don't want you to pursue any of my exes. I have a thing about that. Yeah, (laughs) I can Um, that hadn't occurred to me, but that makes sense. (laughs) Yeah, like I don't want you, even if like we like the same thing, no. Um, (laughs) So thinking about that, thinking about also how much time. Yeah. And I think we need to be realistic. I think it's okay to say, hey, you can have a date once a week and then there could be maybe a few text exchanges, but I'm not, I don't know if I feel good about sort of instant messaging for two hours at night. Right, right. Well, we're sitting there watching TV or something and you're right, texting. Right, right. So I yeah. think that's another thing about boundaries and about contact, like how much contact are you going to give, you know, Because I think we can't control how we feel and what develops in these relationships, but we can control our behavior. And if we go in with the intention of, I don't want another primary partner, which I'm going to loosely define as someone you may live with, someone you're in a committed relationship with, you may raise kids with them, mix finances, make important life decisions. So say you're not looking for another primary partner. 
then you've got to be realistic about how much time you spend courting or flirting or developing an emotional relationship with someone who's going to be a secondary partner. Right, right. I mean, the way it's coming to me is it's, okay, there's the who, there's the where, there's the how, there's the why, there's the what, you know, like to talk about as much of that as possible. Because I also remember clients struggling because their partner took their other partner to like their restaurant. Oh, yes. Or watch the movie. You were supposed yeah, to yeah, say we were gonna the Star Wars movie. movie. <laughs> or the next episode of Homeland or whatever it is. Yeah, you, know? you got you to say that. You can't. The other thing is we can't assume that our partners know what we want, even if we've been together for 20 years. Yeah. You've got to say it and say it very clearly. Yeah. Um, there could also be a discussion, quite honestly, about money and finances and resources. Yeah. I don't want you to spend, you know, we have a tight budget. We have kids, we have whatever. I don't want you spending more than this amount per week, per month on another partner. Yeah. Yeah. Man, so that's just, also, hitting, I mean, it's hitting me how much of this people are going to trip across, though, that they, you, yes. there's no way to anticipate all of these different things. Well, and also a lot of these things within mononormativity within the structure that society says we're going to be monogamous and we should all be monogamous and that should be our goal. A lot of these things are unspoken. Yeah. Right. A lot of folks don't talk about money. I know you know that (laughs) and it's a source of conflict. (laughs) Right. A lot of people don't consciously sort of come to the table and say, what do I really want? How much time do I want to myself? How much space do I need? People sort of go along blindly in the dark and sometimes they they really take for granted that they haven't sat down and actually thought these things through. Yeah, even about sex, right? What do we want out of sex? Absolutely. What do we want to be doing with sex? How yeah. often do we want to have sex? Like, yeah, right. Yeah. Most of those conversations are not happening. Some And some people may say, hey, there's this one sexual thing that we do. It's really sacred to me. It's really important. Um, I haven't done it with a lot of people. I would like to take that off the table for other people. I want that to be our thing. Yeah. Totally valid. Yeah. Do, and what about thoughts about, okay, one person's really gung-ho on non-monogamy and the other one is not so much. <laughs> How, are, right. Are specific tips for approaching this that right. help those people really, again, I don't want to use the word succeed, be happy. <laughs> be happy. Well, First of all, you are not going to, you know, carry someone kicking and screaming to non-monogamy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. That's just not going to work. So I think if someone is reticent or anxious or just not quite sure, you've got to kind of go at the pace of the slowest person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there might be a lot more talking on the front end. There might be a lot more processing. I think it's fair to say to a partner or to say to yourself, like, what scares you? What are your fears here? What's the worst case scenario? Yeah. What's going through your head? What do you think is holding you back? And some people may not know in that moment, right? They're like, it, it tenses up my shoulders when I think about it, but I don't know why. Yeah. I have yeah. to come to the words and the, and the why. And that's like personal work that you have to do. So I think... It, that's a valid question. What do you think is holding you back? Because the answer may be, this is 100% not for me. And then it's not for them. And we yeah. could talk then about a mixed relationship where one is non-monogamous and one is monogamous. But I think the, the person who is, you know, the, is less interested or isn't the person who brought it up, we've got to let that sink in. Because the other thing is the person who brought it up has been thinking about it for a while. (laughs) They're they're pretty (laughs) eager. Like, let's do this. They've been thinking about it and reading about it and talking to themselves about it and maybe even talking to peers about it. So you got to let that other person catch up. Yeah. Because that other person may be like, I thought everything was fine or I like the way it is or I never thought about that. What is that all about? And then I think there's great resources. There's classes. There's online resources. There's books where someone could really kind of figure out, hmm, is this for me? And I think it's important to read the stories of real people. Um, One of the reasons I included that in my book, I interviewed 125 people, all walks of life, and I shared their stories, is because I think we have these preconceived notions 
about what an open relationship is. And they're different for everyone, depending right. on what you heard as a, as a young person, depending on what you've read, depending on your one weird friend who does it and you find them really <laughs> weird. And so I think it's important to read real accounts from real people to get a sense of some of the realities, yeah. right? Rather than some of your sort of projections or fantasies about what you think it's going to be like. Right. Now, here's kind of a specific question because I'm thinking about some of the couples I've worked with in therapy, you know, and so one person will have decided, I need this. I mm -hmm. am non-monogamous. Right. And the other partner really is not there. So it's a, it's a choice of, it basically, it comes down to we're either going to split up or we're going to try this. You think that's ill-advised for somebody is, I don't really think it's for me, but I might as well at least try it as a, I mean, it's kind of a last ditch effort. Right. Um, I mean, listen, we make choices and compromises within relationships all the time, right? Yeah. And some of them can be as simple as Brad wants to go to Hawaii. I want to go to Jamaica, but we're going to this year go to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's like a real simple, hopefully uncomplicated <laughs> one. Although I pick Hawaii all the time. Right. But we, we, do, we, we make these decisions about what we're willing to compromise on. What's a softer boundary that we could then think about changing? We, we make these decisions all the time. So I don't want you to see this choice about trying non-monogamy as like an outlier, right? As like, a, just it's not an outlier. We make choices all the time to come together, to say we're on the same team, to say, hey, in this case, we don't want exactly the same thing, which most people don't want exactly the right. same thing. Right. And so where is the middle ground? Where is the compromise? Where is the thing that makes both of us feel good about this? So I would say if someone is genuinely like, I'll give it a try, I, I would let that play out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, I, and I would not talk about it as a kind of ultimatum. Right. Or if this doesn't work, we're through. If this yeah. doesn't work, you've, then you've got to stop seeing anyone you started to see. I think it's okay to sort of do it and see what are we what are we doing here? Is this working for me? Is this not working for me? Uh, I think that's okay. Yeah, yeah. if they're yeah. genuinely interested and going to go into it with an open mind. Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's talk about the biggest pitfalls or, or mm. complications that people hit, <laughs> anticipated or not. Yeah. You know, what are the kinds of struggles that people hit? Yeah. Uh, and then what do they do? <laughs> so as I said before, I think sometimes they go too quickly. Yeah. Right? That's that's a thing. So I want you to go slowly. So if they do go too quickly, they realize, hey, I went out and, and um, I slept with your best friend yesterday because we decided to open it <laughs> in right. the morning over coffee. <laughs> right. And now I'm here. Right. So then I think you need to breathe, step back, process that that, and not say well, now that I've slept with your best friend, I want to sleep with her every day. We, we got to take a step back. Yeah. Because you didn't talk about, it sounds like in that case, you didn't talk about the boundaries or the limits. And, and also the first time can be hard and anxiety provoking for people. For some other people, it can be a turn on. They want to mm -hmm. hear details or yes. they want to think about it. They want to think about you having sex with that person. And that's very sexy to them. So, you know, it's, it's sort of different for everyone. I also feel strongly that people should not negotiate on the fly in the moment. What is, so give me an example. Okay. Me an example. So let's say we've never been to a swingers party. We're talking about maybe swinging, maybe opening our relationship. We want to check this swinger party out. We've agreed it's okay to flirt with people and make out. Okay. So okay. we get in the door. We meet some swingers. And one or both people are like, wow, this is really going well. And I'm, I feel a real connection to these people. And this feels really hot. Like, should we like have sex with them? <laughs> when you're aroused and turned on, your, your boundary shift, uh, the, the decision-making part of your brain is not at the forefront. As if you'd been drinking. As if you'd right? been drinking. Like, Great. Yeah. Yes, you're turned on. And I feel like making decisions in that moment when you're turned on they may not be decisions that you would have made. Okay. So, so even I if say both people are sort of like, yeah, maybe even if both people, yeah, I say okay. we made the agreement, 
We're going to stick to the agreement. We can always come back here. We can get these people's number. We can say, hey, you know, we're interested, but not tonight. Yeah. There's all these different ways, but I think you should kind of stick to a plan. And that's, of course, also about the sort of diving in, right? If you've never been to a swinger party, you don't need to swing at your first swingers party. (laughs) You know what I mean? I'm imagining never. Okay. I have not been to a swingers party, okay. but I can imagine that people recognize the new people, you know, and that they're absolutely they, they and they form them. Yes. Well, but also they probably, maybe they're a little protective of, you know, Hey, it's their first time. We know people have to dip their toe in the water. You know, these right. are, uh, there's probably a term for them, newbies or something. Right. About, right. You know, give them some space. You know. So I also think, you know, I mean, jealousy remains one of these primal. Yeah. <laughs> It's very visceral for people. It's very real. You cannot intellectually argue with yourself to not be jealous. Yeah. And I think dealing with jealousy is a lifelong process of both unlearning what the culture has taught us about how we should partner with people, what love is. Love and jealousy are very mixed up. Like if you really love someone, you should be jealous, right? Not true. So some of it is about a kind of unlearning process. And some of it is about unpacking how jealousy shows up for you and and why. What what is the what is the signal that jealousy is giving you? Is it I don't feel safe with this other person? Or I feel like now I'm not gonna get as much time with my partner because they have another partner yeah. or I'm not going to be number one. What if they fall in love? We have all of these fears. And so I think it's, it's okay for us to sort of dive into those. And again, I think with support and support I, either a therapist, a therapy group, or a person who's experienced non-monogamy is very often destructive to go to your friends and family members who have never experienced this and say, Hey, I'm really struggling with jealousy because Bob went out with this new girl, Mary. And, you know, I'm a little bit like, Oh, I don't want to be jealous, but I am. That's most often the response is not supportive. Right. um, And can be destructive and can be discouraging. So I want to say, reach out to people who have experience. Um, yeah, even therapists, right? Not every therapist is exactly a therapist well has either, to be right? competent, and you and you can right. ask a therapist what is your level of of experience and knowledge about open relationships. How many clients have you seen who've yeah. been in open relationships? Remember when you're when you're first meeting with a therapist, or maybe you're in the middle of therapy. It's been years, and now you want to do this. You, it is okay to ask these questions, right? I mean, you want the best fit possible. And you want a space where you can say anything. Mm -hmm. If I felt like, oh, I can talk to my therapist about everything, but sex, no. Yeah. That's not what I want. I want a space where I can talk about anything. Hey, we're going to just take a short little break here. And I want to let you know about Intimacy with Ease the method that helps otherwise happy couples create a sex life that is fun, easy, light for both people. So if you are an otherwise happy couple, if sex is the elephant in the room or sex is the little bit of the challenge for you guys, you may want to check this out. Uh, You can go to intimacywithease.com and you'll see information there. You'll see short videos. You'll have access to a full webinar about it. All kinds of information to let you know if this would be the right thing for you. the balance of what someone, let's say they're jealous, they're, they're processing on their own in therapy or something versus processing with their partner and to what degree, I mean, I'm sure there's not a simple answer to this, but to right, what degree right. is their partner? I mean, they're not responsible for their jealousy, but the no. point at which um, we either have to slow down because you're struggling with this or, you know, the role it should have in their arrangement. Yeah. I think, again, that has to be a sort of collaboration between mm-hmm. people and because someone may say i have certainly found this in situations where i'm like you know what this is bringing up a lot of jealousy for me but i kind of know where it's coming from and i am already in therapy and so i'm going to give you the green light 
and just let me work on some stuff, mm-hmm. right? That's valid. That's valid. Other people may say, this is bringing up jealousy for me. And I think there's things we need to talk about, about needs that aren't being met between us um, right. in our relationship. What I'm specifically jealous of, right? Because we we often compare ourselves to other people and we can often heighten the whole notion that the other person is like, better than us, you know, they're smarter, they're sexier, they're richer, all the things. And, you know, people are people. So that's never true in my experience. Mm -hmm. I've never met anyone perfect. Um, (laughs) But, but certainly the jealousy can prompt discussions. And then that may also prompt, you know, what would make me feel better if you don't take this person to parties with all our friends. Right. Cause so that right. may generate a boundary or a limit or an agreement, yeah. which soothes the partner who's having the jealousy. But I don't think you should fall into the trap of the, of the person of the partner of the jealous person being like, I've got a hundred percent caretake you. I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I don't want you to be jealous. Now I feel bad. Now I have guilt. Now I have shame. I'm going to cut this all off. Like, Everyone's responsible for their own feelings. Right, right. So jealousy is not generally going to be a come to a screeching halt. It could if it's serious enough. If it's giving someone daily panic attacks, I might say, I don't want to give you daily panic attacks. Yeah. But if it's making someone uncomfortable and they're grappling with some things, I think it's important for the partner to sort of give them the space to do that and not to sort of fall into the their feelings are my responsibility. Right. Right. And all of this, of course, sort of points to what you said about how much processing is necessary about all these things, boundaries, desires, jealousy, Mm -hmm. reactions, all this different kind of stuff. Okay. What other kinds of pitfalls do people hit? I think one is really simple. Sounds really simple, (laughs) but it's time management. Uh, Um, I think in general, Americans are overworked, stressed out, too busy. When you think of all the elements of our lives, they take up a lot of space and time and emotional and physical labor. And where where is the room, right? Where's the room for both yourself? One thing I think people do is they they start a new relationship and they're working on the existing relationship and then they just say, okay, I don't really need time for myself. Yeah that's always going to backfire. So time management is important. You may not be able to be spontaneous. You may have to say date night is Wednesday night. You know what I mean? You may have to say, we're going to plan this two weeks in advance because I have to get childcare. I have to line up this X, Y, Z, right? So, so let's let go of the spontaneity idea, fantasy. And then I think when someone says, I want more time with you, that that's an opportunity to unpack. Mm -hmm. Because time is this kind of finite concept that we all agree on. We all agree on exactly what time it is because (laughs) Apple or our phones or whatever are telling us it's this time. So you agree with what time it is. I agree what time it is. But when someone says, I want more time with you, I think that that's an opportunity to say, what is behind that? Yeah. What are you really missing? Do Yeah. Yeah. Are you missing attention? Are you missing affection? Are you missing intimacy, closeness, time where we're unplugged? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I think there's all these assumptions when you live with a partner, for example, that like that partner gets more of your time. But if you're both working, you know, full-time jobs and you have children to care for, parents to care for, many of the hours that you spend with someone living with you are, are asleep. Well, or, or, which is not quality or, time or checked out, like even, you know, <laughs> or we're in front of the TV or trying to like right. grocery we're re- shop, right? We're recording this in the midst of COVID quarantine, right? And so mm-hmm. people have like so much more time together, and yet it's not quality time generally. No, no, so, yeah. So I think to make that assumption that like one partner has more time than the other, I, I think let's get to the bottom of what you really want or yeah. what you're feeling like you don't have. Yeah. So I'm wondering about pitfalls around communication. You know, like, first of all, how much do you share with your primary partner about what's happening and how is that going? But I'm also wondering about, 
I can imagine people fall in a trap of I go out on, I've got a secondary partner and I start talking about my primary partner or like where those boundaries are. Mm-hmm. About who's, mm-hmm. who's telling who what and where does that go? Yeah. That seems like that can get very messy. This is a concept of emotional privacy, okay. right? And it's a good one. It's a, it's a really good question. I think people don't think about this in advance. Yeah. Let me say that. And then they get into it and they're like, oh my gosh. And what, what needs to happen is everyone, everyone, the, the, the primary partner, the secondary partner, everyone needs to say, this is what I would like. And then everyone needs to come up by consensus with what you're all agreeing to, right? Because one partner could say, I want every single detail. Tell me the whole thing. Spin it out for me. The story, I'm super turned on by it. It's totally arousing. Tell me during sex. I want to know everything. Yeah. Some people want to know everything because they want to feel like they're in the loop. Right. If I don't know everything, then we'll fill in the blank of what the fear is. I feel right? unsafe. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, and other people are like, you know, I think, you, you know, for me, I'm like, tell me things that impact me. Is the relationship escalating? Is it becoming closer? Do you want to spend more time with that pe- person? Um, did you have a safer sex slip up? Mm-hmm. Which then affects me because we're sexual partners too, right? right. I want to know about things that actually impact me. I don't want to process your relationship, your other relationship. I think you can do that with friends, with supporters, with a therapist. Um, I don't think that that's a good boundary. And, and then also, if I'm a, a partner who says, tell me all the details, but the person who contains the detail, the person who's making up the details, the other partner is like, I really want, I'm feeling really private. I don't want someone to know like what we did or a blow yeah. by blow or whatever. Then you've got to come to an agreement between the three or four of you and say, what feels safe here? What feels comfortable? And what's going to work? Because I, I, I do think people deserve and are entitled to privacy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, certainly there are some people who say, I don't want to know anything. Yeah, I definitely have unless it's like my life is in jeopardy. I don't like I don't want to know. Don't tell kind of no. Um and don't ask, don't tell. I mean, I've seen it work actually. Yeah. But it everyone's got to be on board with it. Right. So there can't be a don't ask, don't tell where someone's pining away for the asking and the telling, because that then shifts the the power balance. But but I think I think you just have to decide between all of you and everyone gets a say. You know, it's the other thing is that I think part of mononormativity is that couples get prioritized and primary partners get prioritized. And I want to remind people that like there are three or four people in this relationship, however many people. And just because you have, there's a commitment uh, or a stronger commitment or a longer commitment with one person doesn't mean that this third person or fourth person is like your plaything, right? Where you just announce the rules to them and they say, "Great." I mean, that's that that's not fair because this person is also a human being with needs and wants and desires and fantasies, and so I don't think it's okay for the couple to set rules as black and white and then sort of just announce them and say, "You're either down for this or you're not." Yeah, because that's um, not true choice either, right? If you're being no, a, no, yeah. and I don't, I don't think it's fair, and I think it's treating people like objects, right? You know, and, and then again, if a if a couple, they've got one of them's got the secondary partner. If you go to that person and complain about your wife or whatever, right? Like that's yeah. got to be so tricky to start triangulating in the psychological sense, of it's, the right? Um, yeah, I think it's just always notable. I mean, I feel like I had this when I got divorced and then had my first relationship after my divorce. I felt very conscious of how much space is my ex taking up in this relationship? Yeah. How much space? Uh, because certainly there are things I have to deal with, with the divorce and with splitting up and with moving out. And these are everyday things that are affecting me. They're on my mind. They may be upsetting me. I may want to talk about them. But if all I'm doing is talking about my other relationship with you, we are not connecting. Right. We are not connecting. So that's that's a little signal to you. 
Yeah. And if you're not dealing, I mean, divorce is a different thing, but if you're not dealing with your struggles with your partner directly with the person, you know, with whom you're struggling, that's not effective either. Right. Yeah. And I don't ever want to feel like I'm pitting them against each other or like, I want to feel like everyone's on the same page and in agreement. Yeah. You know, I don't want to feel like, oh, well, so-and-so thinks this because I've told them all your bad secrets or all your dark spots or whatever. (laughs) That doesn't feel fair. Yeah. So where do people get into trouble with um, what I'm going to call veto power? I mean, I think that's something Mm -hmm. people Mm -hmm. use. I don't know if that's a... Yeah. (laughs) People in the community, what do you want to use? But, you know, having it or not or how it gets used or not or respected or not, like, is that a place people kind of trip up to? Right. So when I interviewed all these people for my book, I asked people who who had veto power as a as an agreement. And a third of people said we have veto power. A third of the people said we do not have veto power. And a third of the people said we do not have veto power. However, if my partner approached me about another partner and had some genuine concerns, that would affect me. And I would listen to those concerns. And right. I may change my behavior as a result of those concerns. Right, right. So that's a little veto-y without being absolutist about it, right? Yeah, yeah. And some people are against veto power. Right. They're like, no one should have be- veto power. You are a grown-ass adult and you get to make decisions. And even if I don't agree with those decisions, I don't agree with that choice of person. I don't agree. You know, as long as you're adhering to our boundaries you know, have at it, right? Yeah. The thing, and and maybe veto sounds too strong. You know, I think there's been a backlash against veto. But what what I feel like is underlying veto, like how it was once developed and then sort of passed down through communities is really about what if I... Literally, I'm having a feeling or I can't stand this person or like this is way too much for me. Like, do I have any say? Yeah. Right. I think it's about people feeling comfortable and having a say and feeling like if there was an extreme situation, you could say, no, no, no. I'll explain it a little bit, but you're just going to go. You're, you're, uh, this is my veto and I don't need to explain it any further. Obviously, people want explanation. They're curious. They're like, what do you see that I don't see? All that stuff. But it's about people feeling comfortable. Now, if you're using veto power as a form of control, right? if you're utilizing veto power six out of seven times, (laughs) if you're constantly using it, then I think it's a matter of power. Then I think you're using it as a tool for power over. And then you need to look at it. Because I think that's the other thing about picking people. You have to decide, do you want to get sort of like prior information about it? When Mm -hmm. I see someone I'm interested in, is is our agreement that I come home, I don't do anything, I come home and tell you, hey, I might be interested in this person or I flirted with this person, but I didn't take any further, but mm, like, is there a kind of a heads up? in advance? Or am I going to make decisions about who I'm pursuing and who I'm in relationship with and then tell you about it after the fact, right? That's going to be a feeling for people, what, whether right. which one they want. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other pitfalls or, or pro, you know, common problems that come to mind that people run into? Oh my gosh. Well, I think that one of the sort of growing conversations within non-monogamous communities is around trauma and trauma-informed non-monogamy. Huh. So there's a book called Polysecure, which is interesting, which is out, um, and I've read some of it. And, and there's, a lot, there's a lot of like posts and different discussions about this. Becoming aware of what traumas or negative childhood experiences you've had, how they impact how you form relationships and how you behave in those relationships. Maybe attachment theory. Some people are really into attachment theory. Right. And and so I think what these folks are saying, which I think is a really important point, is that we can't 
analyze people's jealousy or their triggers or what freaks them out or what's really upsets them or what they feel like they need as a boundary. We, we can't look at those kind of in a vacuum. Right. L- let's look at why this really, really hurts you. You feel deeply hurt. Let's look at why this thing is a deal breaker. Mm-hmm. And often, you know, people react in so many different ways in relationships. And sometimes people are like, hey, I want to give you carte blanche, but they're a people pleaser and they're like adult children of alcoholics or, you know what I mean? Just to generalize, right? Yeah, and yeah. so they're caretaking and they're all about, I want to meet your needs. I want to meet your needs. I want to meet your needs. Well, we have to consider that, right? right. We have to consider is there a power imbalance here that is causing my partner to say, I don't want to set any rules? Yeah. Do, do they really not want to set any rules or do they feel like it'll cause conflict or do they feel like, you know, it will prioritize them or they feel like they don't have a voice to speak up? So I think trauma-informed relationships are the sort of next bastion that people are talking about. That you know, jealousy doesn't just float up out of nowhere. And it often has to do with past relationships, family of origin, wounds. And so we've got to look at it in a bigger context. So given that, which, you know, if people are going to approach uh, non-monogamy and want to be trauma informed, they want to take this into account. I I mean, it sounds like this would be a place to go to therapy. (laughs) Absolutely. Let's make sure we've really recognized our abilities to speak up and recognize our needs and understand where the wounds might be and proceed with that, you know, in advance. I mean, because I guess you could also go later if you trip over this and it becomes problematic, but. Right. I mean, I'm of the mind, just to give my bias, that everyone should be in some form of therapy. I do want to say that there are a lot of different modalities Yes, and traditional talk therapy may not be the way that you learn, communicate, uncover things best. So I don't want to prioritize one kind of, you know, like cognitive behavior therapy or talk therapy. Right. But I do think that there are a bunch of different modes and models out there and I want everyone to have access to them. (laughs) You know, I think, I think we, we deprioritize mental health in this country and we especially deprioritize it or make it inaccessible for marginalized folks. And so it is not an automatic thing, right? Like going to the quote body doctor, the physical doctor, which some people also can't access. So, you know, I feel like this sort of neutral third party is invaluable, right? They're not your friends. They have no horse in the race. Right. They, they work for you. Yeah. Um, and, and you can really dig into some of these deeper issues, right? Yeah. Because some of this stuff that comes up when you're in an open relationship, like I said at the beginning, right. it's all about you. You're going to say it's all about her or him <laughs> or them, but it's not. It's really all about you. And you can't sort of stay static in that. Right. You've got to acknowledge it and then say, okay, now what, I'm in, what am I going to do with it? And most people, I think, need help. I, I think people need help to unpack this stuff. Right, right. So where can people find you? What kind of things do you have that they might want to know about? Yeah, so my book is called Opening Up, A Guide to Creating and Sustaining Open Relationships. And you can get it wherever books, you know, whatever bookstore you want. Please support independent bookstores. <laughs> My website is tristanterramino.com. I promise if you spell it wrong, it should still come up in Google. They're like I'll, well, fairly well know my name. <laughs> I'll put it in the show notes too. So. Okay. Um, because I do teach classes on open relationships and I have like a day long open relationship intensive. So you can see if that's coming up. I have a site called openingup.net which is primarily the home of the open list, which is a list of therapists primarily, but also other professionals like doctors, lawyers, real estate agents, relationship coaches, you know, all different kinds of professionals who have um, experience with open relationships and knowledge and a good knowledge base and are competent So uh, that's a really good resource for people. It's the first place, you know, I send them when they say, hey, how can I find a really good therapist? Oh, and then I have a, uh, I'm sorry, I have a podcast too. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> right, right. Oh, I have a podcast. It's called <laughs> Sex Out Loud. You can go to sexoutloudradio.com. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's on all the podcast platforms and it's about sexual health and wellness, pleasure, community, and justice. So it's sex with a sort of social justice lens. Yeah. And new episodes go up every Monday. It's weekly. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.